There may be only minutes, seconds left of someone's life. Why waste time? The instrument check ride is a peculiar ride. You have three basic types of approaches to shoot, with upset recovery and usual attitudes to prove to the DPE. My check ride was August 14th, 2020 with Cody Reynolds out of his home base, Corona Airport, Kilo, Alpha, Juliet, Oscar. I did all my training out of Fullerton Airport, Kilo, Foxtrot, Uniform, Lima, and had to fly to Corona to meet Cody on his turf. Cody was awesome enough to give a packet which detailed out everything that would make the transition from pre-oral documentation, making sure I have all the requirements met, to the oral part of the check ride super easy. I flew over to the check ride with my instructor Matt Fialos from Fun Outside Aviation. I was super nervous but totally ready for the ride. We arrived at the west side of the field using runway 25. Corona is an uncontrolled field but active in flight training activities. This day, however, was blissfully silent on the comms. We went into Cody's office and sat down while we did some small talk, and as I was producing the required documents and paperwork for Cody. Once Cody had gotten through all my paperwork and Matt was done asking if everything was set like a nervous flight instructor, Matt left and the oral portion of the check ride began. As per usual on a check ride, we began with the pilot's bill of rights and the three outcomes of a check ride, discontinuance, fail or pass, and which I knew which one I was determined to get. Cody opened up with the basic questions on IFR regulations, just to see how much I knew for the basic knowledge. The types of questions that are the free ones if you did your studying include how to stay current, IFR regs, navigation and orientation, the IFR system in context. This went for 30 minutes or so, and after we broke into four flight for my flight planning, my given flight plan was flight plan to Kilo, Bravo, Foxtrot, Lima, Bakersfield. The weather at the departure airport is 500 overcast, two statute miles visibility. Cloud tops along the entire route are 14,000 feet. There is a forecasted freezing level of 10,000 feet. The weather at Bakersfield at the time of arrival is two statute miles visibility, 200 broken, 300 overcast. Plan to fly the FASTO 2 arrival. Wherever you, wherever you choose an alternate, the weather will be adequate. Based off this information, I designed a route which allowed me to stay below the 10,000 foot icing limit, which was the main concern. It was Corona, Paradise, Victor 186, to Darts Intersection, to Victor 459, to the Lima Hotel Sierra, Vortac, Fasto.Fasto2 arrival. There was one point along this route that I had to go below the MEA in order to stay out of the icing, but I was still above the mocha. However, the main catch which he wanted me to find was that the flight was a no-go because a crucial nav aid, the Lake Hughes VOR, Lima Hotel Sierra, was out of service and that was my only possible connection point. We spent a while talking about chart symbology and how best to create routes for flight plans. There was a few things on this section of the oral like total distance box and an IFR low end route chart stumping myself with alternate minimums and where in the heck to find those dang alternate circling minimum sizes. The fun part of these mess ups was the first one. There's a small box on Victor Airways that tells you the total length of the Victor Airway. Cody pointed out the box and asked me what the numbers inside it meant. I quickly said, it means there's 54 miles from XVOR to YVOR. He just paused and stared at me blankly as I went into a full breakdown mode and began over analyzing the hell out of this simple low end route chart. After 10 minutes of watching me struggle, I decided to go all in with my answer and declared it. It was just a simple distance declaring box. He just simply said, yes. Much to my frustration and confusion, I smirked and forgot about it as an aviation applicant should do. Anytime the DPE doesn't fail you on a question, assume you did the right thing and forget about the past. Never look behind you on a check ride. The DPE check ride fee is there waiting to be paid again. As Dory says, just keep swimming. The next part came up was when he was asking me about alternate minimums. This came from after he asked me what my alternates were and why I selected them. The main point here was that he wanted me to realize that some fields are not available for use as alternates, and in my case because the MDAs for the VOR approaches were too high. I pointed out the alternate that I would go to and why, and then he asked me what the small A in the triangle is on that plate in the top left corner for this VOR approach. I simply said, its alternate minimums are significantly higher for this plate. He said, can you show me where the alternate minimums are? I knew that they were in the terminal procedures publication, but I never actually went to go look for them. In my head, I thought he was talking about the circling radius for the VOR approach, and obviously I could not find them anywhere inside this publication. 
The alternate circling radius minimums, its small black box, the white C in it, and where to find the actual number of the size of the circle was the issue. I knew it was 1.3 miles at 90 knots a circle, which is standard, but what happens when it's not standard? That's what I had to look up. This was my brain fart. I was scrolling and searching desperately trying to find where in the heck those circling radiuses were. The whole time he was waiting for me to find the alternate minimums, in which I finally realized that they are simply in my foreflight when you click on the airport underneath procedure dash arrival dash alternate minimums. He then chuckled and wondered what happened as I explained to him my silly error. Long story short, I learned on the check ride that alternate circling radiuses are under page 4-9 of the instrument flying handbook. It's always important to know the details of your approach plates and be confident in your answers. After we spent a long time on approach plates discussing alternates and specific types of symbology, we went back into the regulations on when you can land on an airport in IFR and what you need to see, what your descent should be look like, etc. We went into depth from the types of approaches and what they consist of from a hardware perspective. What are the components of a glide slope? What happens when your glide slope goes in op? What's the difference between a localizer and ILS, etc. We talked about VOR usage and how best to optimize them for flight planning. He also brought up back courses and what it means for us as we fly them. The last area of discussion was systems in the airplane and scenarios that I would be put in regards to icing and what to do. We went into detail on all the systems getting into the nitty gritty of how the pedo system works and its effects on your instrumentation which is crucial to know. Pedo blockages, de-icing equipment on your 172, failed pedo instruments and their effects, all of it. It was knowledge tested that I'm glad I could also prove to myself on this test I was able to handle. He then said with a smile, congratulations, you passed the oral, and two hours later we were on our way to the airplane. Before we entered the airplane, I had a dinner brought with me as it was about 6 p.m. Cody and I chatted up by the plane as we both ate some food before we departed. This was kind of an awkward transition phase as he was basically just waiting for me to stop eating, like honestly though, when am I not eating, <laughs> and be ready to go fly. Meanwhile, I'm making small talk trying to calm my nerves in my head because it's going a million miles per hour and everything I have to do. The thought of bringing up my podcast, JPL Aviation, which I document my journey to discuss necessary decision because I was choosing not to record the check ride as it inhibited me from properly introducing it into the conversation. This was a smart move as taking the check ride needs to be your number one priority and aeronautical decision making decides for me in this case that it is best to have a sterile cockpit in my mind while on this critical day of flight. Before I got in the plane, we debriefed what our departure would be out of Corona. He had me do a straight climb out to 800 feet AJL and then began a right turn with a vector he gave me to intercept vector 186 off the Paradise VOR. I pre-flighted the airplane a little extra thoroughly, making sure to pay attention to the IFR instrumentation areas. We hopped in, I started her up using the checklist and did a quick brake check showing my commercial knowledge, run with a thorough brief, and was on my way to runway 25 for the planned departure with my hood ready on the back seat. Takeoff was smooth as ever as I climbed out of Corona Airport and at 500 feet he commanded me to put the hood on with a positive exchange of controls in which I promptly followed. I was under the hood following the spoken departure procedure and was on my way to intercept Victor 186 while I tuned into the Paradise VOR. I was very nervous for this portion of the check ride because it wasn't something I was used to doing, yet it was the simplest. I intercepted, I intercepted the radio just fine with VORs, cross-checked on my iPad using a Sentry GPS location that my instructor lent me, much to his mercy. Once we got out near Lake Matthews practice area, he told me we were going to do unusual attitudes and simulate wake turbulence. I put my head down and he put the airplane into a simulated wake turbulence attitude and I recovered. I then went down once more for an another unusual attitude in which I was in the blue side of the attitude indicator. Full power, nose down, wings level, and he said, nice recovery. He then gave directions that I was going to track back to the Paradise VOR and pick up a VFR practice approach clearance for bracket field. Kilo, Papa, Oscar, Charlie, shooting the ILS 26 left approach, followed by a partial panel localizer on the same approach, which was a huge relief for me not having to switch to many of my avionics, and finish with the VOR Alpha back into Corona, which is a very difficult VOR approach. For the first approach I was tracking back to Paradise, I had to find and tune the frequency for SoCal, get my approach plates ready, and call into SoCal system with my request. I then set myself up at 90 knots, a solid 5 miles out from the approach course, and then said to Cody, sorry if I make your day a little longer, but we're flying all these approaches at 90 knots, in which Cody replied with, hey man, whatever you need to do, in his typical friendly manner. SoCal Tracon was running smoothly and set me up with a decent intercept angle, and I was able to fly the ILS down the whole way perfectly centered from start to finish, and I was quite very, very proud of this one. However, despite my moment of joy, I forcefully refocused myself like I did in high school with my athlete-like determination. 
The game just finished the first set and I had two more sets to go. I then went missed, picked up SoCal again, and began the vectors for the second set of this game. The localizer approach into 2-6 left, Kpok. This was the most interesting part of the check ride as Tracon threw me for a loop. As I was two miles from the localizer intercept, Tracon said 9 9 or 157, reduce speed 20 knots. And never in my training had I been told to reduce speed when I was already going 90 knots. After I promptly configured the aircraft for nearly perfect slow flight, they then said 9 9 or 157, continue heading. Fly past the localizer for traffic. I replied promptly and thought to myself, isn't this just a perfect mixture of slow and blowing past the intercept? My instructor's wise words were flowing in my head as I was flying back from my last mock check ride. You know, Justin, no matter what you do, somehow on your check ride, ATC will always throw you for a loop. This was my loop. ATC then sent the last transmission before interception as 909-157, tight left turn to 050 heading to intercept final. As I executed a very tight turn in slow flight and intercepted the localizer. This is when Cody threw on the partial panel simulation, a sticky note. I flew the localizer down about three miles from the final approach fix when the tower suddenly closed the airport and turned it into a CTAF, pilot controlled airport. This is when Cody stepped in and thankfully made position reports as we, tuned early, as we turned early from the course about one mile away because other VFR traffic were clouding the pattern. This situation provided a little bit of relief as I was flying the second hardest part of the ride and it forced Cody for safety as other people were in the pattern to turn me a little earlier than I normally would on my partial panel localizer approach. Nonetheless, I was aligned in that proper altitude. I then did a climbing turn southbound after reaching Cody's localizer point to pick up SoCal. I requested the VOR Alpha into Corona and flew direct paradise and I was tuning and setting myself up for the Corona VOR Alpha approach. Game set. I planned on doing a parallel entry and brief the approach while setting my timers. This approach is particularly difficult because of how fast you must turn on a narrow heading after you do a lap in the pattern and chop and drop lose 3,000 feet within 4 miles next to the airport. We had to hold prior to the approach to show that I could make a proper entry into the holding pattern and correctly fly it while timing concurrently on my watch. In my holding pattern, which I executed a dang good looking loop I must say, we then called ourselves established and shot the approach. I flew the VOR all the way down to the airport for circling approach. I talked myself all the way through the approach, Dean died the airport inside of my MDA and buttered the landing, which is another note I was very proud of. However, I knew to keep flying the plane all the way until the engine was out to avoid any sort of stupid mishap. We taxied all the way to his hangar this time and once we stopped rolling, he looked at me and said, you can shut it off and congratulations, you're now an instrument rated. And I smiled and said, thank you. My relieved, sweaty, exhausted self followed him back into the hangar as we debriefed the check ride. He printed out my temporary airman certificate from my instrument rating and let me know that, a, that my real one should be coming in the mail within 20, 120 days. If it doesn't go, send a good old complaint to the slow FAA. If you made it this far into the article, then there's something about the journey of aviation that you recognize value in. The instrument rating isn't just a rating. It is a challenging journey that ultimately led to my personal growth far beyond in which I never thought possible. Beauty is limitation, and in our own personal limitation is where beauty is found. However, beauty is not just the mere consequence of your shortcomings. It is the constant growth and successes that you will achieve in your life. This IFR journey I went on for a year pushed me to my limits and made me into who I am today. It took a boy, gave him a burden of responsibility, a little bit of anger, hope, and ambition, and made me into who I am. I'm not a pilot with 10,000 hours and a vast knowledge base of experience. The journey of expanding your own limitation and finding out what you're capable of is where beauty exists when you look back down the mountain you conquered. The gold at the top of the mountain is only as valuable as the lessons you learned on your way to the top. Never stop ascending. If you found any value in this article or anything I do with the podcast, please share it with two friends who are in aviation or someone who you may think have some value in this. Thanks for the support and on to my commercial and CFI ratings I go. JPL Aviation is where leadership in aviation take off. Thanks, guys.